the same person that I used to be. I'm glad about that. I'm not who I used to be. But you know what? That's a choice we have. To not be that, to not do that anymore. We're going to talk a little bit about that, about how that happens. And uh, so I've entitled this message, Enough of Everything for Everybody. It comes out of John chapter 3. We're going to start with, arguably, or not, the most popular verse in all of Scripture, John 3.16, and extend down through verse 21 through the end of that chapter. But if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them and follow along, beginning in verse 16, John's Gospel, chapter 3 where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Let's go to the Word, to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we open your Word for this portion of our worship this morning, Father, we pray that you would illuminate these words and more importantly, your meaning for us for today. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have you ever been uh, invited to an event that uh, that promised? Okay, um, there was. It's we'll call it a celebration of some type. There were going to be lots of events, you know, uh, games, music, entertainment. Uh, lots of food maybe sounds a little like homecoming maybe okay but we go to these things and have you ever been to one and guess what they ran out of food and you didn't you didn't really you kind of felt gypped okay because you got this invitation maybe there was an admission price associated with this ticket, maybe not, but anyway, you went with the expectation and the guarantee, so to speak, hey, everything's going to be here as much as you want, enjoy yourself, but when you get there, it's not exactly what it was advertised to be, and you feel like you kind of got shorted, okay? Maybe it wasn't quite truthful. There wasn't enough for everybody. Uh, I remember when I graduated uh, college and began my professional work career, uh, I went to work for IBM out of college as a sales rep. And we they placed us in Tyler, Texas. That's, that's where my sales territory was going to be, in Tyler, Texas. But the branch that I was working out of was in Shreveport, Louisiana. That's where Liz grew up. And so we had sales meetings that we would have to come back to Shreveport for every couple of months. And so when we would come back for sales meetings, I would have three or four guys that 
would always want to go to lunch with me because I went to Liz's grandmother's house for lunch. She would cook, and I mean, it's it was good, old-fashioned, country grandmother cooking, okay? It wasn't, uh, you know, chicken nuggets that you got at Kroger. I mean, she fried the chicken, or she did the hamburger steaks, and she did the butter beans and the peas. I mean, everything was handmade, and, you know, custard pie that I really just want to fight somebody over that last piece. So good. But I remember I would call her and say, Mama Ruth, uh, I got three coming with me today. And she'd say, there's plenty. Y'all come on. And I remember one time she told me this. She said, Mike, don't ever worry about it because there's enough of everything for everybody. Well, John 3.16 is kind of like that. It's enough of everything for everybody. Okay? In the way of context, um, I'm going to share this someday, but I, you know, this is no great surprise. Um, I, I kind of uh, did my own little survey a few years ago uh, of top 10 Bible verses. I was doing an event for a recovery ministry and kind of did it like y'all remember Letterman used to do his top 10 list. Uh, anyway, top 10 Bible verses. Needless to say, John 3.16 was the most popular. It is the verse, single most taught verse to our children in Sunday school <laughs> in their early years in church. It is the verse that is whispered to people as they are about to pass this life. Do y'all remember the guy who used to show up at all these sporting events, the football and baseball games that had, this is back in the 70s and 80s, and had the rainbow colored, multicolored, uh, Afro looking hairdo? I mean, it was just everywhere. It was out like this. And he would always have that John 3.16 sign, and he was kind of, kind of a crazy guy. But he was everywhere. I mean, I never understood how the guy got tickets to all these things. World Series, NBA, Super Bowls. Uh, it's known by more people than any other verse in all of Scripture. So why does it have enough of everything for everybody because it is the most precise and encompassing summary of the gospel in all of the Bible. It's got enough love, it's got enough sacrifice, it's got enough invitation, and it's got enough life for everybody. So I'd kind of like for us to maybe rediscover it a little bit this morning the first thing that I'll mention is that this scripture has enough love for everybody. First part of verse 16, for God so loved what? The world. Didn't say that God so loved Israel or God so loved the United States, which we weren't the thought of then. We were him, but not to anybody else, because he already knew that. There's enough love for everyone. He created the world, and he loves the world. Now, the world right here, the reason that this was a little bit unique when this was penned is because it's a bit of a departure from the Old Testament message, which was primarily to whom? The nation of Israel. When this verse says, for God so loved the world, it opens up the message of the cross, the gospel, to those outside the Jewish faith, 
outside the, quote, nation of Israel to the Gentiles and ultimately to the uttermost ends of the earth as we read in Acts chapter 1. What if he didn't love the world? I read a book many years ago uh, by a guy named D. James Kennedy who was the author of Evangelism Explosion out of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Great, great writer. Wrote another book, which I can tell you, if you want to pick up a really good book to read, and it gets kind of deep, but there's a book called Why I Believe. He wrote that book. And it talks about why I believe in heaven, why I believe in hell, why I believe in the virgin birth, why I believe in the resurrection. There's so many topics. Um, But he wrote a book entitled, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? Uh, hard book to read, just being honest with you. Good book, but a hard book to read. What if he hadn't loved the world? It would be, we have no hope. That hope that Matthew sang about, that we talked about last week, would be non-existent. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, you were without hope and without God in, in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were very once far away have been brought near. Why is that? Because he has drawn us to himself. And why does he do that? Because he loves us. No matter what we've done, he loves us. Remember the thief on the cross? No matter what we've done. That guy done really very little good. I mean, he's about to die. No matter what we've done, he loves us. no matter what our position is. Uh, for those of you that have been here uh, on Wednesday nights, you remember a couple of weeks we talked about the blind beggar at the pool who was born blind, and yet he was healed by Jesus. But I mean, he was a beggar. Uh, you know, on the opposite end, and, and just in this chapter, uh, the beginning of uh, chapter 3 in John uh, where we read about Nicodemus who was one of the Pharisees and one of the leaders in the temple and synagogue well thought of he's here the beggar guy he's here what about the woman at the well no matter how worthless we feel he loves us at our highest at our lowest there's love enough for everybody. There was a story of a guy by the name of Henry Monroe. Harry, I'm sorry, Harry Monroe. Any of you ever heard of a guy named Harry Monroe? Okay. Harry Monroe lived in Chicago back in the late 1800s. And one night he had uh, his lifestyle was such that he was drunk pretty often, okay? And he is walking past this Pacific Garden Mission there in Chicago. And a guy goes out, sees him, and, and Harry Monroe was actually contemplating walking out into Lake Michigan and taking his own life. And a man saw him and brought him inside and got him a place to sleep and something to eat. And later, the next day, he was shared the gospel. Someone shared the gospel with him. And he accepted Christ. The verse that they used, John 3, 16. 
Harry Monroe not only became active at that Pacific Garden mission, he later became the president and superintendent of that very mission. And he stood at a place and preached the gospel where he lay one night in a drunken stupor. And when he passed away, they said the line to pay their respects was around two blocks to get by and pay their respects to this man, Harry Monroe, because of what he had meant to that city, to that community. And there was a guy named Thomas Campbell that raised this question. He said, what made the difference between the man that walked into the mission and the man who walked into the said the world would not have missed the penniless derelict if he had jumped into the lake. But God saw great value in him. And that's what he sees in all of us. There's love enough for everybody because for God so loved the world. No, nothing is excluded there. Okay? Second thing. There's sacrifice enough for everybody. That he gave his only begotten son. Okay? He gave his only son. God's love, the first thing that's mentioned, was his motivation for the sacrifice of his son. Was it enough? There's enough of everything there for everybody. A sufficient sacrifice. Y'all will find out over time that I do love Isaiah chapter 53. The chapter that describes the suffering servant, the life of Christ as he is about to go uh, and be crucified. The prophecy surrounding that. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. There's sacrifice enough so that we don't have to. There's a painting uh, entitled The Chess Player. Some of you may have heard of this. Uh, it's a picture of two people playing chess. One is Satan. And the other is a young man, and Satan is sitting there on one side of the chessboard and he's looking smug and arrogant like, and the name of the painting was Checkmate. And the young man on the other side of the table has this look of despair and hopelessness on his face. And he's just staring intently at this chessboard. Very famous painting. In fact, it was purchased by a guy named F.W. Borman, Borum, who was uh, one of the great preachers in the 1900s and early 2000s uh, of, in Australia, F.W. Borden, what a great, uh, I've got some great, a couple of great stories about him. Anyway, he saw this painting and he wanted to buy it. But there was a guy who was a grandmaster chess champion and he came to see that painting. And the story goes that he looked at that painting so long staring at the painting and where the pieces were that were still on the board. And that he called the curator of that museum, which was in Paris, and he said, bring me a chessboard and pieces. And he set up a chessboard right there where that painting was on the wall. And to those that were watching, they had kind of gotten really kind of you know, confused, but 
uh, kind of captured in what was going on, he said, I'd like to take that young man's place. True story. And it says that this chess champion, this grandmaster, took the chair and that chessboard that had been placed in front of him with the pieces exactly where they were in the painting. And he took one move. He made one move. And he says, Satan, checkmate. There was one move left. So whoever painted the painting obviously was not a chess champion because there was one out. Folks, there was one out for us. And that's what Jesus did. God sent him as our sacrifice. And it's the one move that said, Satan, check me. It's done. There's love enough. There's sacrifice enough. There's invitation enough. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him. You like invitations? You know, it kind of usually makes you think that you know, somebody thought of me to send me an invitation for something. I know it's a little different these days with, uh, you know, social media, uh, that kind of thing. Things operate a little differently uh, than they used to. But there's a word in there that says, whosoever. Very unique word. <coughs> whosoever. It's a, it's a general enough term that it refers to everyone. And yet it's particular enough to mean anyone. Okay? Whosoever. Does that limit it to anybody? No. Whosoever. Am I a who? I am a who. It applies to me as an individual, but it applies also to all people. So here's what I want to, I'm going to ask you to do this. We're going to recite this verse. But where it comes and says, for God so loved instead of the world, I want you to say your name. For God so loved Mike. Okay, you ready? Okay, this is not hard. We're not going to be giving out grades, okay? <laughs> For God so loved mine. Wow. Did you hear all those different names? For God so loved mine that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, all encompassing yet narrow enough for me, should not perish but have everlasting life. That ties directly, well, number one, it ties into verse 17, which you'll see in a minute. But it also ties back to what we talked about last week. The living hope, the lasting inheritance in 1 Peter chapter 1. There's invitation enough for everyone there. And then finally, there's life enough. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you rather have temporary life or everlasting life? Rhetorical question, okay? We do have a temporary existence in our, as humans, but we have life and hope beyond this life, okay? Our natural lifespan, 70-something to 80-something years, I don't remember exactly what the statistics say now. Uh, Psalm 90, verses 10 and 12 say this, the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Uh, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and fly away. Teach us to number our days right that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Our humanness always has been and always will be temporary. Uh, 
we're all familiar with Socrates, the ancient philosopher, supposedly one of the wisest men that ever lived. As he was on his deathbed, he was asked this question, Socrates, shall man live again? And his only response was, I hope so. In contrast to that, Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, an explorer and uh, representative of Queen Elizabeth I, as he lay on his deathbed, he was asked the same question. And in his Bible, he, he turned to his Bible, and in the inside part of his Bible, it said this, from this earth, this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up. We don't have to say, I hope there's life beyond this life. We can know. Because this verse gives us the assurance. Now, just to confirm and validate that word, that verse, in the context that Jesus had just had a conversation with Nicodemus, I'm going to read this, verses 17 again. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Here's the bottom line. We either make a choice, okay, that we are going to accept God's gift of grace through faith as the only way we will ever be made acceptable in God's eyes. We make that choice, and we make it knowing that that's what we're doing, okay? The re reason I emphasize that in that way is simply because of this. For people that don't make a choice, they made a choice. Right? There is no neutral ground. Not possible. Can't, you can't stand on the fence. You, there's, there's a line, okay? And one side, we're saved. The other side, we're not. Guess what? Standing on the middle of the line, not going to work. <coughs> Having, here's, here's what a lot of people try to do. I'm going to have one foot on one side of the line. I'm going to have the other foot just over that line. Yeah. No, we're, it's all or nothing. I've, I've shared with you all before the 5149 principle that I like. 51, I've done 51% good things in my life. 49, not so good. I'm 51 is ahead, so I'm good to go. No, we're not. We're not good to go. Why is it so important for us to talk about the gospel? Because we are talking about the very power that God has provided for us to be saved beyond this life and know that we will spend eternity in heaven, which we talked about three weeks ago, that he is, in fact, coming again. It is a truth. We can depend on it. But how many people know when that's coming? You remember that? Nobody. Nobody knows. He's put us here, in this community, Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, to do a job for a, to be a witness this community for this time. 
let's be faithful to fulfill that. And there's nothing but more important. No more important question ever to settle than what have you done with Jesus? Because he is enough of everything for everybody. Would you bow your head? Father, if we submit our petitions to you this morning, our focus, our attention, on maybe your signature verse in all of Scripture, we are thankful that you love the world so much that you gave your own son. And that that is available. And you did that for everyone. And that in doing so, that we would not perish, we would not die, but we would have everlasting life and we would be able to know the assurance of that today. For those that are certain of that, we thank you. If there's anybody here who's not 100% certain of that, we pray that we would be able to help them so. <coughs> Father, that you might use us in that way. And for those that we know, regardless of where they are, that they've never accepted you. Father, we pray for opportunities to share your love, your sacrifice, your invitation and your life to them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 350.